took time to establish that there are two Adams. When it comes to the issue of salvation and the issue of sin, there are two Adams. Adam, who is the progenitor of the human race, where sin is concerned, and Adam, who is the progenitor of the human race, where righteousness is concerned. So in Adam, we see sin, we see death, we see condemnation. In Adam, we see righteousness, we see life, we see justification. Now when it comes to sin, sin is not individualistic. Sin is what affected all of humanity as a result of the fall of Adam. When we look at righteousness, righteousness is not individualistic. Righteousness is what has been made available to mankind by the obedience of Adam. We saw first Adam, we saw second Adam, we saw first Adam, we saw last Adam. And we established that the last Adam implies that there will be no other Adam outside of the last Adam. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Let's proceed. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Next verse. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Next verse. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now man was to exercise dominion on the earth. But man was not to exercise dominion outside God. The dominion of man was to be within the confines of God. Man was to exercise dominion within the will of God. Everything was to work according to God's plan. But we will see that man became disobedient because... He refused to exercise dominion or authority within the confines of God. That's why God said to man, in the day you eat, you shall surely die. Meaning God gave man choice, gave man will, gave man the freedom to make the choice. Man can make the choice. Man is responsible for his actions. But man is not responsible for the outcome of his actions. Man can make the choice. God gave man the freedom to choose. Man is responsible for the actions. But man does not control the outcome of his actions. Meaning that God didn't predetermine man's choice. Because before this Genesis chapter 2, there was no death, there was no sin in the earth. So Romans chapter 5 verse 12 now gives us an, an understanding. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So God gave man a choice to exercise the dominion he gave him. It was absolute dominion, but not sovereign dominion. It was absolute dominion, but that dominion was not sovereign. Because that dominion was under God's sovereignty. Sovereign means someone that has no authority above him to control him. Man had absolute control over all. But the day you eat of it... You shall surely die. You are in charge of everything but to show man that you are not sovereign. The day you eat of that one, you are responsible for eating, but you cannot control death. Please follow carefully because I'm, I'm going to get into some technicalities. That's why I'm being a bit slow. So Adam is a creature of dominion a creature of authority and a creature of choice. Dominion, authority, and choice. 
but not a creature who exercises sovereignty. He's a creature of authority. He's a creature of dominion. He's a creature of choice, but not a creature who is sovereign or who exercises sovereignty. Jesus too was an Adam. Hello? Jesus too was an Adam. First Adam, second Adam. First Adam, last Adam. So if first Adam was a creature of choice, it will imply that Jesus to being an Adam was a creature of choice. Same thing. That's why when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, I don't want. That was the first thing. I don't want the cup. Creature of choice. Then after a while, he said, not as I will. He submitted his dominion to the sovereignty of God, which is what the first Adam never did. Are you following? That's what the first Adam never did. The first Adam did not acknowledge sovereignty. He did not submit to the sovereignty of God. He took his decision independent of God. Therefore, he could not control the outcome of his decision. He couldn't control that. Because he is not sovereign. He is only sovereign in the earth. He is only sovereign absolute in the earth. God gave man dominion over the earth. But God was sovereign over all. And the sovereignty of man on the earth was only going to function properly under the sovereignty of the overall God. Which if man refuses to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, then there will be a malfunction in his system. Are you following? Please pay attention. This is going to help bring some clarity the fact that Jesus had a choice showed that Jesus was human. The next thing to note is that man eventually ate the fruit and was cursed. He wasn't cursed by God. It wasn't God that cursed man. But man's disobedience brought the cause to man. And then God, when he saw that man has disobeyed has brought the cause god instituted the plan of salvation god instituted that plan in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel that is the plan of redemption enacted he will bruise your head meaning redemption Two Adams. By the sin of Adam, humanity was made sinners. All of humanity. Now, look at the wisdom of God. Imagine if everybody was created at the same time. All of the human race, the over 7 billion human beings were on earth at the same time. And Adam sinned. What chaos? You can imagine the chaos. Over seven billion well the, i mean the earth is way way more than seven billion people die every day people are born every day so if you calculate the deaths over centuries put together what is seven billion so you can imagine the billions of humans on the earth if all were created the same day and man fell you can imagine the chaos but god in his wisdom spanned humanity over generations so that there is control to this disaster are we watching here yes that's the wisdom of god because nothing would have stopped all of humanity produced at the same time other than the wisdom of god that's where god becomes omni science hallelujah are you following okay watch but God in his wisdom created Adam. Okay? And after creating Adam, God also created another Adam so that in one Adam, the problem was created 
And in the other Adam, the solution was provided. As you are seated right now, there is nothing around you that doesn't have a solution. There is solution on ground. And as your amen will come like thunder, I declare for every situation around your life right now, receive solution. I'm not hearing that amen. Receive solution. Somebody shout, I have solution. I have answers to the questions of life. I thought somebody would shout a powerful amen. Now, follow me carefully. Man was born in a state, but in order for man to enjoy the solution, he will have to be born again in another state. Man was born in a particular state, but for him to enjoy the solution provided, he has to be born into another state. He can't enjoy the solution in that state where the problem was created. He must move out of that state and be born in another state in order for him to enjoy the solution provided hallelujah first corinthians 15 22 puts it like this for as in adam all die even so in christ shall all be made alive all died in adam all are made alive in adam christ christos the man the man so in one man all die and in order for you to see the application of the seed principle because every seed is supposed to produce after its kind so in one man all die in another man all are made alive so let's see the effect of the death that took place in one man genesis chapter 5 verse 1 this is the book of the generations of adam in the day that god created man in the likeness of god made he man next verse male and female created he them and bless them and call their name adam in the day when they were created and adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name seth so the first child that was born to adam after the fall was born in the image and likeness of adam not in the image and likeness of god that is why everybody is not a child of God. And all human beings are not the image of God. Because you are the image of your father and mother that gave birth to you. That's why you look like them. That's the result of the fall. Now man begins to reproduce according to the law in Genesis after his kind. What was man's kind? Falling. So what will a fallen man produce? He will produce himself. So that implied that by that law in Genesis, if the progenitor of the human race has fallen into sin, what does it imply? Everybody born from that lineage is what? A sinner. You're not a sinner because you lied. No, you are a sinner because that's how you were born. You see? Before you told your first lie, you are a sinner. So it's not because you are lying that you are a sinner. And it's not because you stopped lying that you are righteous. Before you stopped lying, you are righteous. How did you become righteous? By faith in the gospel. Not because you stopped some activity, but because you believe the gospel. Just like how did you become a sinner? Because you were born in Adam. And in Adam, how many died? All died. Please follow me carefully. It will help you. Because if a man cannot understand the plan of God for his life, he will live a life on earth as a misfit. And God doesn't want you to live a life of a misfit. He wants you to live a victorious life. Somebody shout hallelujah. In Romans chapter 5 verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift for if through the offense of one many be dead, the offense of one many. Now, Paul now begins to give us precise knowledge. Pay attention. Paul begins to give us what? Precise knowledge. Okay. First of all, he said, by the offense of one, as in the first Adam, how many died? How many? Please talk to me, citizens. How many died? Okay. All died by in one 
and his name is Adam. But look at what Paul is saying here now. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, not all be dead. First of all, in Corinthians, he says all died because he's looking at man as a function. But when it now comes to individuals, not all died. Many. Now the question I know you're going to be asking in your mind is, then who didn't die? Okay, follow. I'm going to show you. Okay, put it back. Romans, where we are. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded not unto all, hath abounded unto many. Because now we are streamlining this fall where the gospel is concerned. There is all and there is many. Don't be confused. If you pay attention, you will catch it. Meaning from Romans, everybody is not automatically a sinner. Because we see many, many be dead, many, not all. Humanity was made in Adam, okay? And uh, therefore, found in sin in Adam. The whole of humanity is found in sin in Adam. Jesus as a function, therefore, is male and female. Male and female in Jesus. The idea many of us have where the plan of God is concerned is this. We all know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. So our imagination is that one day in heaven, and, and the story I'm about to tell that many of us can identify with that. One day in heaven, God and his angels were sitting and having a nice time. God was sitting, all angels were together. And as they were having a nice time, one angel just stood up and said, I want to overthrow God. I will be like God. I will take over government. And he went on a campaign adventure. Okay? And in that campaign, he succeeded in winning votes from many angels. And then after he has set up the conspiracy well, okay? He now engaged God in a fight. And the fight was so fierce that he almost defeated God. But somehow, somehow God managed. God managed to succeed. And the moment God succeeded in stopping the coup, God threw him down. So as he fell down, he destroyed the earth. And in destroying the earth, he made Adam to sin. Okay? Are you here? That's the way we think. Okay? And the moment Adam sinned, he took over. Then God said, Ah! What shall I do to contain this rebel? Then God said, Okay, I know what I will do. My son will die and overthrow him to recover power. That's what all of us were told. I was taught that both in Sunday school, in CRK, you know CRK? Christian religious knowledge, BK, Bible knowledge. I did both CRK and BK. Such a thing never happened. That's the first thing. Such a thing never happened. So the first thing I want you to do is wipe it up so we can establish what really happened. All scripture is given by and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching or explanation. So let's get the scriptures to explain to us what actually happened. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, there was nothing before Genesis 1.1. So there was no such thing as God was sitting down in heaven with angels and they misbehaved. No such thing ever happened. There was nothing before Genesis 1-1. 
Because Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, And the earth was toho boho. That's a, that's a Hebrew word. Toho boho means the earth was nothing, nothing. Toho, nothing. Boho, nothing. So the earth, there was nothing before Genesis 1. It was toho boho. Nothing, nothing. So to say that there was, there was a world before the world of Adam is to question the, the authority of scripture. Because scripture tells us, which is the basis for our doctrine, that nothing existed. It was toho boho. So that will mean that the first time earth was created was Genesis 1.1. Then that will also mean that God had been before Genesis 1.1. That will also mean that there was no Satan before Genesis 1.1. That will also mean that there were no angels before Genesis 1.1. That will also mean that there were no humans before Genesis 1.1. And that will also mean that there were no dinosaurs before Genesis 1.1. Because Genesis 1 1, God was creating. Then Genesis 1 2 says, The earth God created was toho boho, nothing, nothing. So if nothing existed before Genesis 1, it means only God was there. So the first time God ventured into creation was Genesis 1. Are we in the house? Okay. So. In Moses' vision, the earth was without form void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Was God showing Moses the plan of salvation? The first thing God showed to Moses was the plan of salvation before anything was created. Because salvation is not an afterthought. Salvation is the plan of God. That is the original intent. That is the original plan of God for man. That's why all scriptures are given by inspiration and they are profitable for all of that. that that's why Paul told Timothy, the scriptures are able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation. Through faith which is where? In Christ Jesus. So salvation was not an emergency fix for the fall of man. Salvation was the original intent. Salvation was the original plan of God for all of mankind. Now, but please follow that means, therefore, that creation is a function of time. Nothing was done before time. Everything took place in time. Satan, in time. Angels, in time. Man, in time. All of the planets, in time. But God, out of time. And watch this. God has always been out of time, is still out of time, and will continue to be out of time. He never was in time. No. He only created time and everything that comes with time. While he himself is independent of time. Are we here? Okay. Now. Since God created everything in time. There was a guy called Lucifer among the angels. Lucifer was an angel among the angels that were created by God in time. And like we all know, God created man before creating the angels. And he created the angels to serve man. All angels. No angel was created to serve God. All angels were created to serve man. God does not need angelic help. God is self-contained. He is God all by himself. Before creating anything he has been, not requiring anybody's assistance. If he never required anybody's assistance, he does not require anybody's assistance. He will never require anybody's assistance because he is God all by himself and has never subjected himself to time he does not need help from anything that originates in time time cannot help timeless only timeless can help time are you following 
Yes. <laughs> Honey, that's why God humbling some of those prophets, he said to them, if I need a house, I will not come to you. If I need a house, which house do you have? If I'm hungry, the food I eat, you don't have it. I won't come to I'm God. I'm not man. I'm the self-existing one. I'm the only one that nobody created. Nobody created. And I'm the only one that nobody knows my day of birth. If I was ever born. Nobody can trace my history. I am the self-existing one. I can tell where all of you came from. And how all of you came out. But none of you can tell how I came. Why? I'm the self-existing one. Are we teaching here? Okay. Now, follow carefully because we're going somewhere. So, this guy, Lucifer, was an angel created among all the angelic beings. And like we know the activity of angels, according to the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He's talking about angels here. Verse 14. Are they not all? How many? Now this all, does it include cherubims, seraphims, all angelic bodies? How many of them? What is the mission of all of them? Are they not all what? Ministering spirits. What is their assignment? Sent forth to do what? To minister for who? For them who shall be heirs of salvation. So all angels were created to serve man. That will mean that Lucifer was created to serve Adam in Eden. He never was in heaven occupying a place of choir master. Never. He never was a choir master. We don't have that in the doctrine of scripture. He was one of the angels that was assigned to do what? To serve man. Is that clear? Okay. Now, in the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel, we have some insight into the operation of this light being called Lucifer. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. He says, How thou art falling down from heaven, O Lucifer. When he was talking about falling down from heaven, he wasn't talking about heaven. He was talking about, he was talking about the atmosphere. Because angels flow in the atmosphere. Not in heaven. In the atmosphere. This atmospheric is called atmospheric heavens. This atmosphere we see, we call it heaven. But this is not heaven. Paul said, I was caught to the third heaven. Meaning that there are three heavens. There is this atmospheric heaven. There is the second heaven. And there is the third heaven. And these heavens are not like lined up where you travel from one to another. How they operate, you can't understand. Just leave it. Are we together here? Okay. So this guy, Lucifer, was in the atmosphere, in the, in the sky, the atmospheric heavens, and the Bible says he fell down. Haven't you read where Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall down like he is not lightning. He fell down from heaven as like it was a figure. What he was saying is, just like lightning falls, psh, Satan fell suddenly. From where? From the atmosphere. Teaching good? So, when you hear people say, demons are flying over their house, it's scriptural illiteracy. Satan does not operate in the air. Because you read, the Bible calls the devil the prince of the power of the air. So some of you think Satan is flying in the sky. And anytime he stays over your house, you feel heavy. And in the course of flying, every time he perches on your building, malaria, fever, all kinds of attack. Satan is sitting over the roof, so you have to open fire. You have to open fire. 
is illiteracy and the devil knows you're ignorant because if you knew better you wouldn't think like that the word air there is the word pneuma pneuma means spirit the prince of the power of spirit the prince of the power of the pneuma the prince of the power of the spirit then he now tells you his location hey kabataka the prince of the power of the pneuma the spirit then he now tells you his location the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience so he doesn't fly in the sky he lives inside people who don't have christ meaning that he carries out his activity through human beings he's not patching on your roof he may be inside the person sleeping by your bed i don't know if i'm communicating at all okay the prince of the power of the air the pneuma the spirit and then he now explains to us his modus operandi he is the spirit of disobedience and his operational system is in the children the children of disobedience disobedience to what disobedience to the gospel so all those that disobey the gospel by not believing the gospel when a man does not believe the message he has disobeyed the gospel when he disobeys the gospel what does he become he becomes an operational center for satan are we here okay follow me this lucifer was a minister to adam he ministered to adam what was his job to what to do what to who to adam because all spirits are to minister to heirs of salvation now something happened between lucifer and adam god didn't create satan god created lucifer lucifer doesn't mean satan and satan doesn't mean lucifer whatever god created was perfect whatever god created was good whatever god created was correct so lucifer was correct lucifer was good because he was created by god but there was an assignment for which he was created to serve man adam was created by god as a figure of he that is to come adam was a figure of christ he was not christ but he was just a figure the job of adam was to have dominion over to be in charge while the job of lucifer was to run errands for adam hello now let me give a very physical illustration just to help your minds if you are supposed to be the director of this facility and you are giving some boys to help you run the facility and then your boys are supposed to go by your instructions and then all of a sudden the boy is giving to you and attached to you to help you run the facility walks up to you and say excuse me sir take that chair so i say take that chair okay and then he takes the chair what has happened positions have changed okay the errand boy has become the boss and the boss uh, so from that moment if you're watching who is sir among the two the errand boy who is boy among the two the boss so from that day what will the boss be called boy and what will the errand boy be called boss Okay. there's a switch of roles and there's a change of name S lucifer was supposed to receive instructions like every other angel from adam but for the first time lucifer gave adam instructions 
Did God say you should not, according to Moses' vision, did God say you should not eat of this tree? And if didn't know what to answer him. Okay. He said, God is wise. He knows that the day you eat of it, you shall be like him. But what was the instruction? Thou shalt not eat of it. So, she took it in obedience to the instruction of Lucifer. She and Adam ate. There was a swap of roles. Satan automatically became the commander. Adam and Eve became the ministers. That swap of role turned Lucifer to Satan. And it was at that swap of role that man died. So two things have happened. Man has died. Lucifer has become Satan. All as a result of a transaction between man and Lucifer. Are you in the house? Now, watch this. You know that God didn't create Satan. God didn't. So the creation of Satan was purely by an interaction between Lucifer and man. Now, watch. That's why after Jesus defeated the devil, he still put the devil under man. Because that's where he should be. So the Bible now says what happened to Adam was that Adam transgressed. Adam was in the transgression. What is transgression? Adam did not heed to what was told him. And because he didn't heed to what was told him, he decided to act absolute authority outside of God's sovereignty. It's like somebody says, well, I control my life. I own my life. I can do what I want to do with my life. No, you're making a mistake. You can't do what you want to do with your life. You don't control your life. You only have that life to function that life within the will of God. The moment you function out of the will of God, you have committed sin. Sin is acting contrary to the plan of God. Sin is doing what you think to do, what you feel like doing, when you feel like doing it, irrespective of what God has said. The moment you do what you feel like doing, irrespective of what God has said, you have sinned. And when you do that, you are responsible for the action, but you are not in charge of the outcome. Oh yes. Adam ate, he died. He was responsible for the action, but he couldn't control the outcome. Because I'm sure when Adam saw that now he has been stripped, he must have thought of how to get it back, but he can't get it back. He is only responsible for the action, but he cannot control the outcome. That's why the child that was told not to put the hand in the fire, the parents said, if you put your hand in the fire, it will burn you. The child did not listen. The child went and put the hand in the fire. The fire burnt the child. The child cannot control the pain and cannot control the extent of the burn. But the child can decide to put the finger. But whatever comes out of that burn, the child has no control over. Medical science will struggle to fix that finger back depending on the degree of the burn. Medical science may not even succeed in making that finger look like before. There will be a dent there will be a scar there will be a malfunction or a design in that finger that makes everybody know that something is wrong with that finger and that child will have to live for life with that scar in that hand the child made a decision but could not control the outcome of that decision don't drink alcohol you say it's my body after all alcohol makes me tipsy it makes me tipsy then you start drinking you are drinking the alcohol you decided to drink it but what it does to your liver you have no control over don't commit fornication you say after all i'm saved by grace i will just commit fornication after all what is it the blood of jesus washes forever that is true but as you're committing fornication 
and HIV enters your body. Yes, you control the fornication decision, but you can't control the gonorrhea and the syphilis and the HIV that comes out of it. So you decide, but make sure your decision is in the will of God. Otherwise, outside the will of God, you are on your own. Any choice man makes outside of God's will is a sin. So that broadens the definition for sin. It broadens it. Because when we talk sin, many of you, what you think of is fornication, adultery, that's what's common. Stealing, lying. If you decide to live a quiet bomb to Lagos outside the will of God, all your life in Lagos, you are in sin. Because you're out of his will. You're out of his plan. You made a decision irrespective of the sovereignty of God. If you just say, well, I just got a better job. When I was in a quiet bomb, my salary was 2000 This one is 5000 Without seeking to know what the plan and the mind of God is concerning you. You moved. And on arrival, your wife died. Your two children died. You were sacked. Now what happened? You made the decision, but you cannot control the outcome. So that's why, again, you must understand the plan of God. And that's what we're going to stay on the whole of this week. Because when you understand the plan of God, you will live in Eden. Out of the plan of God is out of Eden. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Eden in metaphorical sense. Because it's actually not Eden, it's heaven. You enjoy the heaven's life. If you reject the gospel, if you refuse the gospel, you have subscribed to death. Eternal separation from God, which begins with his exhibits here on it. Are you blessed? Everywhere is quiet. Hallelujah. We know that Lucifer was created in Eden. The Bible tells us that in Isaiah. You know, he was created in Eden. From the day, you know, Isaiah tells us, Ezekiel tells us, um, God made Adam the God of this world, but Satan gave Adam instructions. Adam complied. That is what we call sin. Romans 6.16, 6, put it up for me for clarity. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. When Adam yielded himself to Satan, who was Lucifer, when he yielded himself a servant, he became a servant of Lucifer unto sin, and out of sin came death. If you yield yourself a servant of anything outside of God, that thing becomes your master. Anything you yield to. If you yield to anything, that thing becomes your master. If you yield to smoking, it will become your master. If you yield to cheating, it will become your master. And if you yield to God, he becomes your master. Thank you, Lord. Adam was made the God of this world. That's what God made him. Adam was made a sovereign only on the earth. And he gave his sovereignty to Satan. Adam took that control, absolute dominion over the earth. And handed over to Satan. In that exchange, it was not only an exchange of roles. There was also an exchange of position. And an exchange of authority. And an exchange of influence. In that exchange... He lost everything. Every. That's why in the book of Matthew, look at it just for clarity. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 4, verse 8. And the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, look at me for a minute, everybody. Satan didn't walk to Jesus physically. That's not what happened. 
Satan didn't go and say, Jesus, are you Jesus? Follow me. No, that's not what happened. So many of you, that's what you think happened. It was in Jesus' mind. Satan spoke to his mind like he speaks to your mind. He says, are you sure you will live another one year? Look at the way things are happening. You will soon die. Satan is talking. The same way he spoke to Jesus. Now, when the Bible says he took him up and showed him, put up that scripture. When he says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, we shall soon understand what the kingdoms are. I will explain. And he said unto him, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil liveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. Question, who delivered it to Satan? Adam. That dominion God gave Adam in the transgression, Adam gave it to Satan. And from that day, instead of Adam being the God of this world, Satan became the God of this world. It's just a swap of office. That's why in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, he says, In whom the God of this world, who is the God of this world? Satan. Who was Satan? Lucifer. So in the plan of God, what did God have in mind? Lucifer or Satan? Lucifer. Lucifer is the plan of God. Satan is the plan of man. So he became the God of this world. Now, when he said, he showed Jesus the kingdoms of this world. Look up. The kingdoms of this world. He didn't show Jesus 30 story building. He didn't show Jesus uh, the tallest building in Dubai. Those are not the kingdoms of this world. No, those are not the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world are the hearts of men. He showed Jesus people's hearts and said, can't you see I live inside all of them. I reside in their hearts. I am the one in control of the human race. Can't you see I own humanity? Because Adam handed over humanity to me. Then he said, Jesus, if you kneel down now and worship me, I will give you their hearts. Jesus said, look at you. I know how to get it without kneeling down to worship you. I will not do what my father has not allowed. My father has not allowed me to kneel down and worship you to get the hearts of men. My father has a better way of getting me to get the hearts of men. What Jesus was simply saying is, to get the heart of men, I am ready to die to pay the price to take man back i will not go through the shortcut i will go through the wrong route i don't know if i'm talking to somebody here so when jesus died that death paid the price for the heart of a man to be stripped of satan's authority i don't know if i'm talking to somebody that is why when the message of his death his burial his resurrection is preached a man's heart is delivered I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. See, the message of hellfire cannot deliver a man. There is no power in the message of hell. The message that carries power is the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. The moment a man hears that, faith, faith is injected into him. And because faith has entered him, even if he's an atheist, he starts believing. See, the power to believe is not in a man. The power to believe is in the message. So, until a man hears the message, he is not saved. Even if he came out for altar call 30 times. It's not altar call that saves a man. If you like, sleep on the altar. For one year, you are not saved until you hear the message. What message? Jesus died. For what? Sin. He was buried. For what? Sin. On the third day, he rose. For what? Sin. 
so right now your sin is paid for if only you believe when a man hears that an injection of regeneration has been released into him am i communicating when he believes that in his heart and confesses that with his mouth he is saved until that happens he is not saved if i stand there and i begin to talk about hellfire is very hot when you enter hell even worms they will be moving on your body fire will burn you but you cannot die it's very hot if i finish all that and i say come out and be born again and you came out crying you are not born again you only came out of fear and fear does not reproduce sons you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but the spirit of adoption we are back you cry so with the heart man believe it you must hear something that carries with it faith It's not how many people gathered on the altar on the altar call. The question is, what did they hear that brought them to the altar? That's why he says, how can they believe on whom they have not heard? So salvation is in the whom. Salvation is in a whom. And for a man to be saved, he must hear of that whom. Is in a person salvation is not in a church that's why you don't say this is my mother's church i cannot leave my mother's church no church died for you if in that church the womb of salvation is not revealed get out it's not a church it's a social gathering what defines a gathering from another gathering is the subject matter after all, this is not only the place where people gather. People gather in stadiums for rally. People gather in stadiums for political campaigns. People, so that a people gather doesn't mean salvation is there. The difference from one gathering with another gathering is the subject matter. What are we discussing? What are we discussing? If we're discussing business entrepreneurship, that's not a church. That's a business school. <laughs> Only Jesus can save. Hallelujah. Only Jesus can save. Hallelujah. You don't know it, eh? I know it. <laughs> you only know everything now, double, double. Oh. <laughs> How can they believe on whom they have not heard? And how can they be saved except they hear about the whom that they didn't hear about from a preacher that is sent? Romans chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Next verse. For whosoever it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your past record. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what shall happen? Shall be saved. Shall call on what? The name of the Lord. Not shall cry for his sin. Not whosoever shall lament and wear sackcloth and ashes. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Next verse. How then shall they call on him? Not on it in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher 
How? Because for a man to be saved, he must hear about him. So there are many altar calls that produce false conversion. False conversion. Because it's clear. For a man to be saved, he must hear of him. Not it. Not 666. Have you heard of 666? 666? So you have not heard of 666. The American chip, they're already producing it. People are just full of stories. So at one point is a man saved when he hears. When he hears of him. Why? Because when he hears of him, he believes. Why? Because the message brings faith. That's why that same Romans chapter 10, as he kept that conversation in verse 17, he now says, Faith comments by hearing. Then he now explains which kind of hearing. Hearing the message of Christ. The message of Christ. King James says, Word of God. The original text, the original Greek says, The message of Christ. So, without hearing the message of Christ, faith doesn't come. And if there is no faith, there is no believing in the heart. And if there is no believing in the heart, there is no salvation. Because salvation only comes when you hear him. And when you hear him, his message produces faith. For by grace are ye saved. How? Through faith. How does faith come? Hearing the message of who? Christ. Stand, let's close. That's where the power is. I'm not ashamed for the gospel. The gospel doesn't have power. The gospel doesn't have power. You didn't hear me, citizens. The gospel doesn't have power. Why? It is. So when you hear the message of his death, burial, and resurrection, what are you hearing? Power to save. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So power to save is in the gospel. What is the gospel? The message of his death, his burial, his resurrection. For if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. If you have not heard about his resurrection, if you don't know about his resurrection, and you say you are a Christian, you are a liar. You are still in your sin. What exits you from sin is the message. Little wonder Paul will come to a church and say, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So that is there is a witch on your pulpit. So there are churches where the people on their pulpit are witches. And what do witches do? They bewitch. He said, who has bewitched you? That's to say, you're under a spell. Somebody's using remote control over you. Glory to God. Lift your right hand and say with me very loud, I am saved. Because I heard the gospel of my salvation. The message of his death, his burial, his resurrection. I believe. In my heart I confess with my mouth therefore I know I know I am saved I didn't hear your amen say very loud my sins past present future are eternally forgiven 
Say with me, I am eternally saved, sanctified, perfected, accepted forever. I didn't hear your amen. Now say with me, there is no more judgment for me. Jesus took my judgment 2,000 years ago. He was judged on my behalf. I am free. I am delivered from the road to come. Therefore, when I think of my future, I rejoice because there is no more judgment. I thought somebody with a rejoicing voice will shout him. No more judgment. All my judgment has been placed on Christ. And you know what God says now when he looks at you? I'm not angry. I'm not angry. So if somebody say God will get you, tell him, no, he got me. He got me long ago. God is not going to get me. He got me already. I'm his. He's mine. If somebody say, well, God is after you, tell him, no, he's not after me. I didn't escape. I'm in him. He's in me. If somebody tells you, well, God is angry with you, tell him, no, the last time I checked, all his anger was exhausted on the cross. And after the cross, he's no more angry. Somebody say he's no more angry. Am I talking to somebody? God say, I swear. God himself. God. He say, I swear. I will never be angry with you. Never. God Almighty. Are you hearing me? God Almighty said what? He said, I swear. I will never be angry. In Isaiah chapter 54. He said, I will no more be angry with you. Why? Because Isaiah 54 came after Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, he says, surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone to his own way. It has pleased God to put on him the iniquity of us all. He has bruised his soul for our sake. Then in Isaiah 54, God now say, as this is as the waters of Noah, just like I swore that I will no more destroy the world with water. Also, by the death of Christ on the cross, I swear, I will never be angry with you. I don't know if I'm preaching here. Wave your hand, shout, God is not angry. God is happy with me. I didn't hear your amen. Now turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, stop performing. Just accept. Because some of us are trying to perform. Some of us are trying to perform. Tell your neighbor, stop performing. Just be yourself. You know, there are some people when it's time to pray, they are trying to impress God. Father, verily, verily, I come before you. It is written. Humble yourself under the mighty heart. God will just laugh and say, what are you? You actor, what are you acting here? Stop acting. Be yourself. If you want to pray, you cannot find a scripture. Just say it the way you feel it. He understands. He lives in you. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask. So even when you are thinking, God is hearing. So make sure you think good things. Cast down imagination. Don't think you will die young. Who am I talking to in this house? Lift your two hands. Everything that you have desired, as your amen will come like thunder, receive supply. Receive answers. Receive answers. Receive answers. Receive answers. Look at me. Nothing is stopping your answers from coming. All those reasons they gave you, 30 steps to prayer answer, 40 steps to answer prayer, carry them and put in a dustbin. Because God loves you that he gave you Jesus, there is nothing he cannot give you. He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely? The guarantee for answered prayer is Christ in you. So open your hands. Are you ready? As your amen will come like thunder, every prayer you have prayed, receive answers. Where there was a delay, I cleared the delay. 
receive answers receive answers receive answers in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and I decree this week is going to be a week of multiple testimonies you will harvest testimonies from the left right back front even your enemies will perform for your testimonies as your amen is coming like thunder they don't like your face but they will misbehave and it will be your testimony they will malfunction and it will be your testimony you're blessed in the city you're blessed in the field the work of your hands are blessed your business is blessed your ideas are blessed your going out is blessed your body is blessed your career is blessed in the name of jesus you will only go up and never come down grace is upon your life receive manifestation in jesus precious name can your amen slap the devil we trust that you have been blessed by this message for these other messages and books by dr abel Damino, please call plus two three four eight zero six eight zero zero nine nine three nine or email power city office at gmail.com Hey, I'm here. Babatu is here. My name is Michael Bush. My producer, complete with his technical team, all of them are here. And Intercontinental Baba Global is here. Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental Mr. Bush. It's so good to see you today. Baba, welcome to this edition of the program. Thank you, Mr. Bush. There's so, can, so many questions. I can imagine. Okay, Baba, let's get down to the nitty gritty of today's action. We begin here from this one comes in. It's a quick one. I'm the one that called the other evening to ask if I was correct in this explanation I gave to somebody that Genesis 1-2 is the heart of man without God and the light in verse 3 is uh, God's plan for soteria of man. Soteria is salvation, yeah, right? salvation. Of man as the proaction of God to man's state. Even as Apostle Paul confirms that in 2 Corinthians 4 6, then Genesis 1-9 which is the third day is actually when God created the earth and the sea. And lastly, the sun and moon were what were created on the fourth day, while verse 26 describes the image of God. Thank you. Absolutely correct. Absolutely wow. correct. Absolutely correct. Imano, we celebrate you. You're just brilliant. Okay, so I'm back with you. I'm back with you. Let's see. We come back to you. My name is Blessing Paul. Hello, Dr. Abel Damina. Please, sir, how can a man be poor in spirit? According to Matthew 5, 3. Also explain Malachi 10, 8 to 11. Thank you. Well, point in spirit is simply humility, you know, humble and seeking to receive. It, it's, a, it's, it's a parable language. That's what it is. So still from Uyo, uh, Mr. Peter, well done, Pastor, for your expository teaching. Could you please explain Ecclesiastes 7, 15 to 17? Does it mean that we should be a little to the left and a little to the right? No, no, no. That was Solomon now. You know Solomon. That's why in the New Testament, you hardly find anybody quoting him. Because Solomon, you know, said a number of things that were called PP sayings. Things that you can only find in an idealistic situation. And a lot of things Solomon said were things in the natural. They had no revelation knowledge. So when you read those books, you read them with caution. You, you, you just look for Christ in them and stay with wherever Christ is revealed. Fantastic. Still from you, Menso. 
Hello, Baba and the great presenter, Mr. Michael Bush. I've been really blessed by your great teachings, and I really wish it could be extended to 365 days of glory so we could continuously dwell in God's glory via your teachings. Baba, you said that the devil was involved in the death of the firstborn in Egypt, which was in order to free the Israelites from captivity, as it was all God's plan. Now, Baba, does that mean that God works in partnership with Satan to fulfill his plans? Thank you. You know, God delivers without killing. If you remember in the prison, Peter was in prison, he was to be killed. And the angel of the Lord went in there, brought Peter out without killing anybody. Paul and Silas were in prison. God delivered them without killing. God can deliver without killing. He doesn't have to kill people to deliver people. Like God doesn't have to pull somebody down to raise you up. Now God is not like that. That's why he's God. So in the killings of the, of the firstborns of Egypt, Satan just took advantage of an opportunity and deleted the firstborns of Egypt. It wasn't God. The Bible says they were killed by the destroyer in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So it wasn't God. It was a destroyer who took advantage and killed. God's role in all of that was to deliver his people and he delivers without killing. A handful of other uh, entries coming from Uyo Akwaibum, where, by the way, this program is broadcasting live from. Mboridem team says, hello, man of God and Mr. Bush have never called or texted any radio station. That's some good thing for you. And says uh, for anything that now I've decided to defend the gospel. You said the fire that came down from heaven by the request of that great prophet was not from God. Please, sir, can you explain 2 Kings 1, 2 or 112 to the world and also 1 Kings 18, 24 and 38? Well, again, you do not explain parables by parables. You do not use figures of speech to interpret figures of speech. So calm down, calm down. In Bible teaching, you calm down first. Don't be in a hurry. Because if you're going to defend the gospel of Christ, you must be taught the gospel first. So what you, you do is the Old Testament is mystery. The New Testament is revelation. The Old Testament is Jesus conceived. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. The Old Testament is types and shadows, figurative expressions in many places, which requires interpretation. So to help you a little bit, Brother Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. How? According to the revelation of the mystery. Old Testament mystery. New Testament revelation, the apocalypsis of the mysterion. So the New Testament reveals the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see Elijah praying such prayers. If I be a man of God, let fire come down. You know, Elijah prayed such prayers and fire came down. Now, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus, who is the reason behind the scriptures, shows up physically to defend the character of God and to defend the nature of God because Jesus is God who became a man to save man. So in Luke chapter 9 verse 51, look at Jesus now. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Next verse. And sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Next verse. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Next verse. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? They are quoting Elijah for Jesus. Look at Jesus' response. Next verse. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Meaning that spirit that brought fire down for Elijah was not the spirit of Jesus. That's why he rebuked them. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he rebuked his disciples for copying Elijah, if he was physically there when Elijah was attempting to bring fire down, he would have rebuked him. Rebuke means he, he spoke to them like demons. Then he added in the next verse, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So again, you don't interpret 
parables or figures of speech by figures of speech. You use the New Testament to interpret the actions of the Old Testament. I hope that will help you for starters. Let me recommend for you before you defend the gospel of Christ. You need to get my teachings on the Old and the New Covenant in Christ. It's about 35 hours. When you have gone through that very well, you can now begin to see how you can start defending the gospel of Christ. Baba. Yes. Okay. So more, we'll make progress. Yes. Still from Uyo James. Thank you, Dr. Damina. Please, sir, while clarifying issues, the other day you said covering of the hair is not spiritual. Can you please explain why the same scripture says this ought to be done because of the presence of angels? More grace, sir. Again, some of you, when you read the Bible, you don't pay attention to English. It's like English is, 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 is not effective in your understanding. If you read the pretext and the post-text, which we keep explaining, don't just take a verse of scripture, line who can sink her and run. No verse of scripture has a life of its own except within context. So you read the pretext and the post-text to understand the context. The Bible is a piece of literature. So the rule of context is critical and key in Bible teaching and study. Now, when he talked about head because of the angels, He's not talking about this head on top of your neck. He explained in the pretext that the head of Christ is God. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. So head, God, head, man, head, Christ. Then he now said, every man that covers his head, which is God, is not right. Because we should allow God to be seen. Then he now said, every woman, every woman that uncovers her head, which is her husband, is not right. He's teaching submission that a wife should be subject to her husband because angels understand hierarchy and angels understand order. That's what Brother Paul was <laughs> outlining in Corinthians. Orderliness. Because things must be done decently. And in order, he wasn't talking about hair. Don't be thinking like a natural man. He was teaching spiritual realities using physical illustration, which is like a figure of speech. More questions still from Uyo Asukwa. Hello, Dr. Damina and Mr. Bush. I was wrongfully removed from my office. I want God to restore me to that office and also recover all my losses. Please pray for me, Baba. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your favor and we ask for an intervention for your son. In the name of Jesus, receive. Amen. Amen. Baba, thank you for your labor on me. My name is Kufre Basiekbo from Brook Street uh, District in Uyo. In one of your teachings, Baba, you said that if man did not sin, Christ would, not, would still have died. But today, I don't know whether that is today, but you made it clear that it's man's sin and death that brought about redemption. Please, Baba, how do I reconcile this? The reconciliation is easy when you realize that God sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. That should fix that for you. God does not operate in time. He operated ahead of time, saw everything and made out his plan. That should help you in thinking. But however, keep following the series because we have not finished. Okay, Baba, many thanks for your labor in word and doctrine. In light of what you taught today about cherubims directing man to the tree of life in Genesis 3, 22 to 24, how do we reconcile that, that with Andrew Womack's explanation, which states that God drove man out of the garden and placed the cherubims to prevent man from partaking of the tree of life in that fallen state, which will mean that man will have eternal life but left with sickness forever. I explained that that was God's love for man displayed. Pastor Odeme, you know you. I've not read Andrew Womack on that, and I do not quote Andrew Womack. I quote the Bible, and I teach the Bible. So I stay with the text of the Bible. The way I taught you, go look at it very clearly. You will see that's exactly what it is in the scripture. Okay, still from you, a princess says, Baba and Dr. Bush, thank you for the great work you both do. I'm really, really, really um, receiving impact. My questions. Is spiritual husband or wife real? No, it's not real. There's nothing like spiritual husband. There's nothing like spiritual wife. Jesus told a story and corrected that impression. And I'm sure he was speaking to some Africans, you know, on a lighter note. Now, they said to Jesus, a certain man married the first wife. He died, the wife buried him. Married the brother. He died, the wife buried to the seventh brother. And then they now asked Jesus, on the resurrection day, whose wife will she be among the seven? 
And Jesus said, there's nothing like that on the resurrection day. Because okay. on the resurrection day, people shall be like the angels. Meaning that there is nothing like spiritual wife or spiritual husband. It does not exist. It's just a fallacy. Princess Inuyo continues, Baba, if angels are spirits, why did they desire and marry women on earth and begat giants as recorded in Genesis? Please also explain Matthew twenty-two thirty. 30. Thank you, sir. Well, again, I have taught that extensively. Angels never married human beings. When you read that scripture in Genesis chapter 6, where it says giants got married to the daughters of men, he wasn't talking of angels. He was talking about human beings. Go and read that scripture very well. Read from Genesis chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 8. You will see he was talking about human beings. And those giants were like people like Goliath. Angels and human beings have nothing in common. They cannot be married. Okay, Mary still says from Akwaibong State. Mary, I'm coming to you shortly, right now. Uh, first caller. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Where are you calling from? Go uh, ahead. Please, this is, this is the name from calling from you. Go ahead and inform. Yes, please, Papa. I have a question on uh, okay. the of Revelation chapter 22. Someone asked me about what it means to, to take a word for, out of the prophecy or to add from the prophecy in the book of Revelation 22, 8, 19. To take a word out of scripture, to add a word to scripture simply means to misinterpret the Bible. Misinterpret. That's okay, let's make progress, Mary, as we leave Akwaibum State now, says Mbaba, Abel Damina, and Mr. Michael Bush, I thank God for giving you this great mandate, that one is specifically for Baba, of course, great mandate of reteaching the believer, the you word of God. part of the mandate, man. <laughs> <laughs> Old and New Testament. You are an asset to the body of Christ, God bless and protects you. Yeah. Baba, please pray for me, I'm a Sunday school teacher, and I've done this for many years with joy. The devil is attacking my vision. Okay, I think we've read this before. Yeah, My vision is cloudy. Yeah. I've gone to many eye hospitals. I cannot read the Bible and lessons even with the prescribed term glasses. Please help me with your prayers. This is a different person. The it's other one was person. a man. Yes. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke whatever is responsible for blood vision. We command your sight to be quickened, restored. We receive a miracle of sight for you right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To Babas, to local government area, but just. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Your name, where you're calling from? My name is uh, Brother Amos Oki from Lagos. Go ahead, uh, brother. Baba, thank you very much. And the bush of the bushes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Nice all over the world now. So don't be mentioning Baba. Uh, you, you are, you are not celebrating. So, <laughs> so that is how you said that you are on learning and relearning, which I got from you that I'm also on learning and relearning. I kept on thinking about this thing all the time, like when you say, let's lift our offering for God. Let's lift it up. I thought of it, I remember that. How are we supposed to lift our offering for God? Yeah, we lift Based up. on things that you've taught us already. I don't want to go too much, too much far. Yeah, we lift up and offerings <laughs> because New Testament. <laughs> and let's just, just let's pray in this offering. But lifting up for God all the time is very difficult. Because I'm relearning, I'm, I'm learning, I'm relearning. <laughs> so this thing is bothering me. Lifting offering for God. That's yes. God that lifting us to live in God. He's starting to live in the whole mortality. He, he, Immortality, dwelleth in mortality, and he sees, is he not? So, I don't know how we lift up in for God. Well, if you read the New Testament clearly, worship in the New Testament is lifting up holy hands. So, our worship of God is lifting up holy hands without doubt and without wrath. Our offering is worship to God. So, when we say lift up your offerings, what we're saying is in your worship of God, you lift up holy hands in reverence which is New Testament. So that's why we lift up our offerings as our worship to God in our giving. It's New Testament. I'm going outside um, Akwaibum now. So for the road, Ekanem, Ekanem is in it too. It says, Baba, please pray for me concerning baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. Also, can one's refusal to partake in the Holy Communion in church hinder his righteousness? Thank you, sir. 
Now, Holy Communion does not make you righteous and does not stop you from being righteous. You are righteous by faith in Christ. Baptism with the Holy Spirit means speaking in tongues. It's very easy. But as I said, we have to go outside of uh, Akwaibom now. And uh, we go by road to Kogi. And Grace Jewel, writing from Kogi, says, Greetings, Baba. Please pray for me that God should restore all my children that Satan had taken away back to me and that that joy and peace should be restored to my family. Well, we don't know how he took them away. Is it death? Or I, I'm not sure. You or I'm not sure it's death. And we ask that you receive a miracle of restoration. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we declare that you receive right now and your joy is full. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. From Kogi to Benue, Michael Prince writing says, Hello, my dear Baba and beloved brother Bush. I was turned out of a great tempest of religion when I heard your teaching, where you said Adam never ate any physical apple on a radio broadcast. That was my turning point in the year of our Lord 2016. Until now, questions I had for knowing God had been answered by most of your teachings. But please, sir, I have a question. What did Paul mean in 1 Corinthians 6 9? Does he mean that those who participate in this act won't do kingdom ministry on earth or that they won't enter into the immaterial heaven? Baby yes. scholar, hello. Thank you for joining us. Just pick up a little. Yes. Uh, my name is Pastor Victor, calling from Aquaibo. Okay. Yeah, please, Baba. I want to thank you for what you have done all over the world. In fact, I was praying. I was praying for God to be to for the revelation of knowledge. But God used it to open my head. Please, Baba, please. I want to make a request, please. I want you to pray for me. For God. Time to be corrected. I have a, I have a body in my side. We are going to pray for you, Baba. Please. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke every blindness, every form of blindness in the name of Jesus. Amen. That makes it difficult for you to see. We command your sight restored. Amen. Restored. Receive Amen. a miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. From uh, Benue State. First Corinthians. Oh, First Corinthians. What was that again? Chapter first, 6, verse 9. nine. Know okay. ye first not verse. that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor exhaustioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Next verse. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So again, that scripture is not for believers. That scripture is for people that are without Christ. Whenever you read a verse, always go down. Pre-text, post-text will always fix the issues for you. Baba from Benue, let's dash to Sokoto. Priscilla writing. Hello, Baba. I need your counsel. What does it mean when a woman sees her period in the dream and wakes up to see that her period actually started flowing? She gets messed up by personality in the dream during her ovulation. Any negative implications? It's like a young boy who played a lot of football in the afternoon. A lot of football in the afternoon. Then he sleeps and at night he jumps up. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. And his mother runs after him. Ogale, Ogale, come and lie down. Come and lie down. And the boy calms down after a few minutes. And then he goes back to lie down on the bed. What's happening to that boy? What's happening to him is simply that a lot of football entered his head and played back in his subconscious. So if you dreamt and you saw yourself having your period, you must have been too preoccupied in your subconscious with the thoughts for your period and for your period to come back. You must have been so worried that it played out in your subconscious. And when it started flowing, it was part of those, you know, subconscious events that worked along with it. So that's what happened. There's no big deal about it. Okay, so from Sokoto, let's go to Abuja, Nigeria. That's the capital of the nation, the political capital, because we still have the uh, commercial capital being Lagos that will be going to any moment now. Kefas in Abuja, thank you for revealing Jesus, Baba. But please, what are you doing about publishing a version of the Bible that will correct some of the translation errors therein? Beautiful question. I do not need to publish a version of the Bible to correct errors. All I need to do is teach you how to do it. Because Bible translation takes a lot, a lot, and a lot. But there are translations you can also lay hold on that will help you. Like the Greek lexicon, the Hebrew lexicon. And there are other new translations that are on the pipeline that are doing a lot of justice, you know, to Bible 
interpretation. Translations like the mirror translation is still very young, you know, and there, there, there are others like that that are on the pipeline. So keep looking, keep studying, keep following. Eventually, all that will be dissolved. This caller, hello. Hello. Yes, thank you for joining us. Your name, where you're calling from, your points. Go ahead. My name is Ifoma Farah. I'm calling from London. You're calling from? London. London, okay. Go ahead, ma'am. I just want to thank Daddy for everything that he has done. Um, I just want to point out that I am less confused compared to before when I was, when I was, I was a Christian before, but I was more confused because I was a Christian, I was a Christian but listening to that, I'm more focused, I'm mentally stable, I understand what the Bible is talking about. It's revealing itself slowly and, and I'm, I'm able to interpret it properly. So I'm less deceived by pastors. So I just want to thank Daddy for everything that he has done. But I just want him to pray for me that the eyes of my understanding continues to be open because the problem now is that I am getting more distracted. It's easy for me to, when I'm watching this program, to, my, my mind just loses focus rather than focus on what he's saying. So I just want him to pray that my eyes continue become, continues to open as he speaks. Amen. Father, we pray for your daughter that the eyes of her understanding be enlightened. We rebuke confusion. You are not the author of confusion. Therefore, confusion, we command you out of her life. We command clarity of God's word. We declare that you are stable in understanding. And we declare that the grace of Christ abound towards you. The peace of God is upon your heart and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so from um, Abuja, we're trying to negotiate um, to Lagos by road, past okay. Baba, okay. to pass through some southwestern states. So Shobo Ocean State is number one. And our friend, Sam Ajala, is there waiting. He says, why does the Bible say Jesus is coming soon? And soon, then, till thousands of years never comes. Because okay. a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand, a thousand years, years is like, like a day. day. With so the Lord. with God, soon is still soon. Absolutely. People pray that he should come quickly because of this corrupt world. Will God answer such prayers? No, he won't. He will not answer because he won't come just because you pray. He will come because his work is already done. So let's keep preaching. Let's keep walking. Let's keep advancing the cause of Christ. Evil is no new to it. It has always been there. So, yeah. We go to Lagos, even as we plan to fly outside the country. They're from Mr. and Mrs. Adebayo is in, Lag uh, in Lagos, Nigeria, and says, please pray for us, Baba. My wife and I are believing God for the fruit of the womb. Baba? We receive. We receive Amen. for the brother who is asking for fruit of the womb. We receive Amen. that miracle, and we call it done. Amen. In the name of Jesus, every part of your body that are responsible for the production, we command it quickened and Amen. we receive that miracle. Amen. Lord, we rejoice that by faith right now, we receive the miracle of fruitfulness for their marriage. Amen. And we thank you for it is done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Baba. Praise God. Okay, so from um, Lagos, we are flying outside the country. I'd like us to go to Zambia. And uh, our friend Kennedy Duo, Luo writes, Hello, Mr. Bush and Baba. There are some preachers who tell the members to tap the pastor's anointing. But is there such a thing, Baba? It's not palm wine. You don't tap. <laughs> <laughs> you have your own anointing. Christ is in you. So don't bother about all those. Those are just jargons. They, they, they are not scriptural. Every believer has the anointing in him. The anointing is the spirit of God living in him. Our last caller is on the line um, today. And I'm privileged. I'm honored to have him. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Just speak up a little. Your name, where you're calling from? I'm a Mayang Samuel. I'm calling from Oyo. Go ahead. Okay, I want to appreciate Papa for all the teaching. I really appreciate all that he has done. I really don't have any questions. I just want to say God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, he just Thank called you. to do appreciation. Okay, let me see what I can do. A quick one inside uh, Africa. There's so, so many of them. McDonald Chideya writes from Harare, Zimbabwe, and says, uh, hello, Baba, and intercontinental Mr. Bush. I started following Baba in 2016 when someone shared with me his sermons. When you preached at Paul at Deferas' Faith to Faith conference, oh, you're teaching 
blew my mind and I was hungry for more till I ordered your books and your sermons. Then I sat down with my notebook to learn from you my pattern. That's father. Yes. It's not a secret that I learn from you every day. Oh, daddy, I'm grateful to have you in my life. You build doctrine of Christ in me that no one can toss me to and fro by any wind of doctrine. We met last uh, in South Africa, the ICMA conference two years ago. What great time we had. I speak an end to this pandemic so that we can meet again. This week, there are seven, 60 days of glory. Something else, Baba. We're learning. Thank you, Baba, for your labor in word and doctrine. This generation is blessed to have you in our time. Surely we are covering this blue marble planet with the fragrance of his grace. We see Jesus. Charlatans and forces are packing out in our time. This gospel is penetrating everywhere, Baba. They are raising an army which is preaching this simplicity gospel of Christ in every country. Here in Zimbabwe, we are pushing the same gospel, reconciling men to Christ. We've been called names, heretics, uh, Calvinists, because we are preaching eternal salvation but we are grateful. We keep pushing this gospel. The good thing, people's eyes are opening and they are beginning to see Christ. My prayer for you, Baba, is to be delivered from unreasonable men. For not all men are of faith. Continue, Baba, to keep yourself in the love of God. You are far from oppression and your family. We love you, Baba, me and my family. We continue to unlearn, relearn so that we can learn. Kabayada. My God, glory. <laughs> David Benjamin. <laughs> oh, a, no. So, tongue. so many of them. So, so many of them. Yeah. It reminds me of Ikutabaya. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so that came from um, McDonald Chideya in Harare, Zimbabwe. Thank you. Okay, Thank so from him, we'll be going to, let's fly outside to France. Oh, my. I have so, so many. Okay, let's go to New York first. Yeah. And this one, Baba, all I can say is thank you for this wealth of revelation. God is dishing out through you. My prayers are with you. More grace. My question is from Proverbs 1322b. Is the wealth of the sinner in that context a figure of speech? Can you please explain that verse for me, Baba? Proverbs, a Godwin rise from Niagara Falls in New York. Proverbs 1322. A good man liveth an inheritance for his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for their jaws. The word sinner there is not a figure of speech. Like I said, Solomon used a lot of natural things. So a sinner in Solomon's context in that scripture is somebody who gets wealth dubiously, dubiously, by who can means. That's what he meant. Okay, so somebody, Matthew, is in New York. He writes, peace and blessings to you, dear Intercontinental S. Anchor, Michael Bush, and our global apostle, Dr. Abel Damina. Question, based on Luke 4.18, you affirm that deliverance is preached, that born-again Christians don't need any deliverance. Sir, I totally agree with you, but I'd like for you to clarify the use of the word deliver for supposedly born-again Christians in Psalm 33, 19, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 2. No, you can't combine the two. Psalm's concept of deliverance was salvation. That's what they were talking about. But I can quickly explain 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, two. Chapter three verse 2. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. That's not delivered from demons. That's not delivered from sin. That's not delivered from Satan. It's delivered from the wickedness of men. All right? So the only deliverance that a believer in Jesus will require is from wicked men, wicked plan, plots of wicked men against you. And that's why in deliverance, we've been delivered, we are delivered, we are being delivered. Just like we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. All right? So it is spirit, soul, and body. So in Christ, we are delivered, we have received salvation. We are being delivered from the plans of wicked and unreasonable men. And we will be delivered when mortality puts on immortality. So it's spirit, soul, and body. That's what it is. From the Americas, Baba, let's fly straight to Europe. And we land in England, Newcastle specifically, and says, hello, Dr. Abel Damina. My name is Favor. I'm writing from Newcastle in England. I wanted to thank you for all your teaching and enlightenment on the Bible. My family and I really appreciate your hard work as you preach both in the mornings and in the evenings, something that most pastors will struggle with, but you make it look easy. However, I have had a question. I've always had a question. How can God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit be free in one? Does that mean they are the same person? In that case, does that um, mean that we've seen how God looks like through Jesus, or are they three different creatures? So does that mean we are serving more than one God? I always struggle to imagine it in my mind. So could you please describe it physically, or is it all just figurative speech? Best regards from Favor in England. Okay, Favor, let me give you a parable, a very simple parable that helps you to understand. The sunlight. You have the ball of the sun. And out of the ball of the sun, you have the ray of light. And from the ray of light, light you have heat. 
but all is from the Son. That's the only simplest way I can explain the Trinity to you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one, but functions in three different ways. So the Trinity is a concept of redemption. God the Father loves man so much and he has to die for man, but he cannot die as God. So he becomes a man out of God to die to save man. And after saving man, he cannot live in everybody at the same time. So he sends the Holy Spirit who lives in all of us at the same time. He's still the same person for, for different functions. Okay, we need to go. We're dashing from England into France, Paris, Glory Idris, right? Hello, Mr. Bush and um, Baba. Please, sir, I need your advice on what to do. I've been in ministry as a worker for five years now, but I'm not seeing what I, I was expecting. Should I leave or stay? I wish I could answer that. Uh, answer, <laughs> Mr. Bush, answer no, it. No, Baba, because I, I think that is neither here nor there. She, yes. she sent an email yes. and give more background yes. because we don't even know what is expected. Exactly, what is right that's the wrong. first thing I wanted that's to right. say. What are you expecting? expecting? Because we need to know what you're expecting when you came into ministry, if we even have the right expectation Absolutely. to start with. Absolutely. So send us a more detailed mail. Absolutely. I'll be able to counsel you. Bye -bye. You see, small, small. No, I'm, I'm making Bush, progress. You know they're calling you apostle. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you are. We need to go, Baba. Cameraman, hands, uh, every studio hands, sound engineers, everyone joins me, Michael Bush, to thank you, even as Papa steps forward for the benediction. Intercontinental Michael Bush, we appreciate you, man, and appreciate all you do every day to make it easy for us to reach the world with the love of Christ. Guys, we love you. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy Christ Jesus. Goodbye. Be blessed. From Uyo, Nigeria. Amen.